the SkyWest world and just completed his initial operating experience. And imagine SkyWest turning him loose in an RJ. <laughs> <laughs> It's qualified. He's flown with me. I'll take Greg's insults. All right, go arounds. So philosophically, I'm going to propose a couple of things that I just want you to think about throughout this and towards the end, kind of bring it back together. So if you treat every approach to landing as a go around and a landing as a, well, nothing happened that forced the go around. There should be a number of conditions throughout that you're planning for the go around. And if any one of those things hit, qualifies for the go around, go around. If you happen not to get any of those events throughout, well, oops, I landed. The airplane ran out of energy, it's on the runway, success, right? This is a different way of looking at it because most people force the landing and then afterwards go, oh, that should have been a go around. Um, and I've been uh, at fault of that myself. So probably one of my favorite students, um, absolutely tenacious, uh, really struggled to put a lot of hard work for this person to get up, up to speed. But I really admired that they really hit the grindstone, they studied hard, and every time they were really looking back of how they could have improved. So short final, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Airplane land with some of my assistants, we ran out of block time. We parked the plane and I opened up the SOPs and I'm like, do you mind just showing me where oh shit is in there? And she paused and looked back and she's like, I should have gone around. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you have that sense that something's not going right, you don't have to make the landing. Um, I mean, I guess if you're running out of fuel, there's some instances that you're gonna be forced to do it. Uh, but bottom line is, we should have a plan in place of when our go around is going to take effect. Uh, we should have places in there that if we see certain things, we don't feel right about it, or if we're not meet meeting the criteria, we're going to go around. Well, this is going to change for everybody in this room. We fly different air aircraft. Some of them are fast, some of them are slow. We fly at different airports, some with short runways, some with long runways, some with wide runways, different wind conditions, whatever else. You might be doing a different maneuver where a stable approach for a power off 180 isn't the same thing as a long instrument approach that's 15 miles out. So you need to be thinking through each time you're approaching that runway, what criteria you're going to hit. And if you don't hit it, go around. Uh, if you can't correct it quickly, it shouldn't be a, a force. So ultimately, why should we prepare for a go around? Well, <laughs> it sucks when you get the wrong thing, right? You should have gone around, airplane's broken, or you just put people at, at, in danger, and it should have been a go-around. So ultimately, what is a go-around? Well, according to the Airplane Flying Handbook, a go-around is a normal maneuver that is used when approach and landing parameters deviate from expectations or when it's hazardous to continue. So a lot of us will practice this as a... Uh, there's a dog on the runway. Uh, the truck just blew up across the runway. Go around to teach our students what a go around is. But I think we could raise the bar on that. And I've heard this today through several people that if we hold our students to a stable approach early in their learning process, it's rare they get a stable approach the whole way around. Lots of opportunity to refine the stable approach and the go around. So other one here has just to continue. So there's a lot of the common sense that, you know, if somebody tells you to go around, you're going to have to do it. Uh, which we'll come into here in a minute. So let's do this without sound and start the first one at 206. Sorry, you gotta get the sound. So. <laughs> Actually, a really interesting one because it looks like it's a student pilot and his flight instructor. They're in the startup queue of the 944 for a second. 
Um, so his debriefs are amazing. He goes through both the 121 world and the 91 world. So there's a lot of really good information in here. But going back to that video, if you look in there, the, the approach didn't look that terrible. Something probably toward the end, they didn't like the way it was looking. Uh, so he, he properly executed or made the decision to do a go around. And what happened? Well, what happens when you have a whole bunch of power and you have a bunch of drag in there at a low airspeed? We've talked about it today already. Left turning tendency, right? And you just watch as they start veering off the runway in a subtle climb, and the instructor's just kind of like, chill, hey, yeah. And you can see them kind of looking for the flight path of where their trajectory is going. No correction in there, no rudder input. Um, and you do notice in the end there, he neutralizes the ailerons at least. So this is all rudder that he should have been at. Uh, ultimately, instructor intervention, going back to Soder's presentation, there should have been something in there a lot earlier than the high impact on the ground. How do you think that went? Um, so on this next one here. More momentum and more things that are going on. It takes some practice to get used to it. We've all done this. Too fast. No. Yeah, nice, right? Nice oh, no. Oh, no. There we go. <laughs> this is actually something really funny to watch. It's called porpoising, and most every pilot's done it. It says in the video that it was filmed in 2006, but it looks like it was filmed in. Thank you for flying Kangaroo Airlines. <laughs> Seriously, right? <laughs> so, this is something that. I mean, clearly you can see high energy state when they're crossing the threshold. There were some things going in there. They weren't hitting the airspeeds they were probably aiming for. Uh, and clearly made poor decisions in there, saying, maybe I could pull this off. It's just a bounced landing. I'll just add a little more. I don't know what they were thinking. But entertaining, right? Uh, lots of opportunities in there to go around. One thing I've noticed with most of these is you don't look at the end and go, geez, that last one, they really should have pulled it off there and thrown in power. Like, Way back there, the high approach speed is probably where you could have gone, yeah, like you knew that wasn't going to turn out well. So when should we initiate? Well, obviously, if ATC says go around, um, that's something we need to comply with. There's a hazard on the runway. This is a typical one as an instructor we always throw out to our students. Overtaking another airplane, this has definitely been emphasized uh, this, this year with the recent event. Uh, wind shear is another one. and. I kind of want to focus a little bit on the wind shear, weight turbulence, mechanical failure, um, and then obviously unstable approach. Uh, I try to teach my students on these that if you treat every approach the same, and now I talk, there are differences, right? Short approaches, power off 180s. But if you've briefed what that's going to look like and you do that the same every time, the only thing you have to adjust for is the environment and external factors. That's it. You can tell when the airplane's not doing what it's supposed to be doing because you're used to it. Uh, it takes a while for a student to pick that up, but once they're there, now they can start fine-tuning what they're doing in there. Um, so unstable approach, I do want to put an emphasis on this. Obviously, towards the end here, I'm going to talk about the scenario, but a stable approach really is the key to a good landing, and we should have our own personal minimum of where that is. CAP is pretty vague on this. We don't have a set criteria of like, hey, if you're not there by 200 feet, um, but they do have the stable approach criteria. You should have a good idea of what that means to us um, and to keep it safe. So specifically getting into the equipment we fly. So looking here at the AFM for the 182, we have the box landing and coming into this a little bit closer. Uh, I'll be honest, I hate this paragraph. This is like the worst worded thing to decide what order to do this in. Because it goes back and then it comes back and says, well, after you've done this, then do this. So I applied the airplane flying handbook to this as well to come up with the order um, to make it a little bit more clear than the way I think that's worded. But ultimately, apply full power. Climb at 55 knots. Reduce your flap setting to 20, 20 degrees. And then if you're above 5,000 pressure altitude, hooray, we're in Utah. Lean your mixture for max RPM. Uh, and then once you're clear of obstacles, carefully retract flaps and then accelerate to a normal climb speed. Cram, climb, clean. There we go. Cram, climb, clean. Okay. So looking in here for what a normal climb is, uh, 
it specifies here just under the general information the 70 to 80 knots normal climb uh, targeting VXVY is appropriate. Then as we come in here for the box landing, essentially just re-emphasizing that you're getting that full power 20 degree flat and climbing out at 55 knots. Uh, that's all we get out of our AFM on this, so we do have to seek a little bit more clarification. Airplane Flying Handbook gives us more information on this. So proper execution, power, attitude, and configuration. If we're looking at this under power, sufficient power, obviously we need to stop the descent. Now we may have energy and excess airspeed, uh, but ultimately at some point you're going to have to add power. You want to get a smooth application of power. For those of us that have instructed and as students, I'm guessing you may have experienced I don't see it as much in Cessna, but it does happen. But in Cirrus, students, they want to cram that thing forward, and you slowly hear that engine sputter, 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 and you have to pull the throttle back so that you can undram the thing and then slowly get it back up so you'll actually get an introduction of power. So one, two, three is a nice smooth application of power. Avoid those abrupt movements. Next is attitude. You've got the power in there. Now, this really depends on where you've made this decision to do a go around, short final, long final, whatever you're at, or you're coming into that below B ref and you're slowly settling into the runway. Potentially, you're on the runway and you're not liking what it's looking like. So, ultimately, you need to make sure that if it's below stall speed, you got to build up some speed there so airplane will fly. Airplane doesn't like to fly below that. Uh, then establish that climb speed so that you can actually get out of ground effect and move on. Um, and making those changes in there. Rudder to get in there, trim is necessary. I'm sure we've all experienced the heavy trim coming in on a power off approach or a <coughs> short field landing, and you cram in that full power and it wants to go up to about a 20 degree pitch up, unless you're pushing that in. So start taking that trim out and then ma maintaining control. The one thing we saw in those videos was a lack of control. They didn't keep flying the airplane, they did the maneuver, and I don't know where they went after that. Configuration, so power set, your attitude set, you stop the descent, obviously you've chosen not to land, so you don't want to keep going down. Then come in and you're going to that takeoff lap setting or as specified in the air, uh, airplane flying, uh, airplane flight thing. And then getting back down here to the bottom, retract the flaps intermittently in small increments. Let the airplane build up energy and speed and then pull the flaps out. Each time you're doing that, what happens to your stall speed? There you go. Stall speed's going up. So you need to make sure you've got the energy back as you're doing that. And visual diagram here just talks what we went through there as you're coming in and making sure you're getting that normal climb out. <coughs> so ultimately, go around to require practice. They're not dangerous. So unless you choose to do something to make them dangerous and more interesting than what a normal maneuver is. Uh, ultimately, the main thing we need to focus on is not delaying the decision to do a go-around, and I'll admit I've been guilty of that, and executing a go-around improperly. One thing I've found as I build experience in small airplanes is I start to feel a lot more confident in my ability to correct a terrible landing. I've been with students who have done some really interesting things, and I feel pretty confident where my proficiency is in that. But I also have to think about going back to what's been said here today, what example I'm setting by pulling it off and making it into a good landing. I don't know that I've ever been with somebody that has a really shoddy approach, and at the end, all of a sudden, it's a greaser on the runway, and I'm like, wow, you're a good pilot. And I don't think that people think that of me if I can pull off a crap approach into a decent landing either. So what gets us into this? Well, we talked about landing expectancy. We approach the runway, we're practicing landings, of course that's what we're doing. And it's not until something catches us off guard that we do a go around. So at that point, now you're not thinking in the briefing mindset, what did I brief as a go around? You're thinking, oh, shit, I think I'll do a go around. How do I do that again? And ultimately pride, and I know as an instructor and as I gain proficiency, um, I think this is something that we all need to kind of let go, that we all take pride in our landings. That's a huge thing pilots pass around of the landing. We don't focus on so much of the stable approach but how good was that landing? And if we can drop that and focus more on the stable approach, the landings will come through for us. So common risks and mistakes, a failure to recognize a condition that warrants a rejected landing, indecision, delay in initiating that go around, and then uh, failure to put in max power. I can't tell you the number of times I've had a student put in about half power and then they dump all their flaps and it's like, nice, 
Luckily, the flaps take forever in our airplane to do anything, so you can quickly adjust for that And if you're guarding the controls. Um, but making sure that they're getting the right things in there uh, as a pilot and as an instructor. Abrupt power application we talked about, a pro uh, improper pitch attitude. Uh, so this is something I see is there's the fear of the ground suddenly. Full power goes in, we have trim in there already, and then you add a bunch of back pressure. Uh, not great going back to load factor and number of other things and getting down to that, that low energy state. Um, and then attempting to climb out of ground effect prematurely. So if you're getting to that point, you're coming through ground effect, you're starting to round out to the landing and you fill the sink because maybe it taps onto the runway, you're at minimal energy state here. It's on the edge, maybe it wants to fly, but you're, you really don't have much. And the only reason it's at that state because you're in ground effect. So there's this tendency of quickly, of got to get out of here, full power, climb out of ground effect, um, and you'll fill that sink, come right back in. So making sure that you're just leveling it off and evaluating that energy state before you continue that climb. Well, when? why even try to climb out of ground effect? If you're actually doing a, a go around at that low of an altitude, you've got thousands of feet in front of you to regain energy and then do a normal climb because that's unless you unless you like waited until you were on the last third of the runway to make a go around uh you got lots of room and you can get, regain the energy and just do a normal climb up it's not like and even if you're in the last third of the runway it's even more important to get up to climb speed before you try to climb exactly so unless you got a cow on the runway and you're trying to get over <laughs> then it's only a four foot climb <laughs> So, Still a ground effect, right? That's I I've done this. I mean, I remember early on, years ago, when I was a new private pilot, and I was working on my high performance. My instructor went out to Tooele, and he did an emergency. He had me do an emergency landing. Well, I overshot the runway and was out over the weeds and got down. He said, oh, I think we can stop now." About the time the uh, grass was hitting the wheels, <laughs> and so I accelerated and I just stayed there. I just stayed in the grass and back towards the runway because there's nothing in front of me. And then and I waited until I had 75 knots and then I just climbed normally. And it was straightforward. But I think what happens is maybe that attempt to climb on the ground effect, we want to get away from the ground. We're not comfortable. And I think we talked about a little with the slow flight, slow fly down the runway. It's people get used to flying low and slow. Yeah, and if this is a properly briefed maneuver, that shock shouldn't be there. Of like, oh crap, gotta go, gotta get up there. Is yeah, now you're just doing that nice slow across the runway, making sure you're down the center line, building up the energy, and then it's just a normal soft build climb out, really. Uh, Paul. Just, just a comment, because when you're in ground effect, the induced drag is so much lower than lower. just another five, six feet above the ground. In a in a airplane with a lot of excess power. Maybe doesn't make a lot of difference, but in like in a 172 or whatever, if you stay in ground excel effect and accelerate, you'll get up to speed much faster. A 172 in July, yeah. I mean, that's a huge factor in there. Why you can climb out and the drag goes way up and you'll never climb. Watch uh, the fighter pilots at Hill do this all the time. Watch them take off. They'll take off, they'll level out, retract the gear, and they will go almost to the end of the runway. Well, and keeping in mind that ground effect is proportional too, right? Yeah. We talk about this wingspan width, but the higher you get to that, the less ground effect you're getting. So if you're bringing it down and holding it there, you don't want to get up 30 feet above and say, well, I'm still in ground effect. Uh, you're losing the effect of that. The more you can stay right close to that runway, build up that energy, and then go off. There was a couple other hands. We lose him? Okay. All right. So, and going back to that first video we saw, that clearly was something that could have happened there. Is they went for the go around full power and then they were, I don't know, starting the, the pattern or something. But if they would have just kept down the, the center line, got the control back, built up the energy, everything probably would have looked okay there. Unless they were overtaking an airplane, but they waited too long at that point. Right. All right, um, so getting in here with a case study, some of you are gonna recognize where I'm going with this because um, you're buffs and kind of where I got the data on this. So 
I get that the facts that I'm about to throw out change with every aircraft. So just apply it to what you're doing. It doesn't, there's no correct answer to this. This really is just something as a thought exercise. I want you to think about where you would be making these decisions yourself. So when would you choose to go around? You're on 14 nautical mile final and ATC vectors you, you're above glide path. So you're seeing all whites on there. Um, 14 nautical miles out though, 182, do we care? ATC throws in a speed constraint. They've got an airplane behind you. They really want to keep you fast so that you can stay away from them. Um, and ultimately, as you're looking down, you realize this is leaving you high and now you're fast. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, compounding effects, uh, now you've got high fast. Um, and coming in here to the next step, apparently I need to point that. Okay, now you're up to five nautical miles from final and well above glide path and you're still fast. So now you're getting a lot closer. This is getting in the range that a 182, you should be thinking. Automation mistake, you screw up on autopilot and you kick it in and it starts a subtle climb uh, and you catch it really quick, kick off the autopilot, um, and, but now you're higher above glide path. Anyone in here getting a little uneasy yet or is this still kind of a, a 182, I'm good? <laughs> All right, we've got one in the back. All right, pilot reduces throttle to idle. They're high, what are you gonna do to get down, right? You gotta get rid of that energy somehow and having that throttle in isn't helping any. So they'll pull the throttle back and they're gonna pitch over and dive and drive. Well, you're gonna have a hard time burning off airspeed with that, but you can get down to the glide path. So five nautical miles out, but you're also increasing your ground speed. So now your closure rate to the runway and the ground is increasing. You get to 500 feet AGL, passing through glide path, 1200 feet per minute descent rate. So we talked about earlier, 500 to 1,000 is kind of a, a, a range that we should be looking at. And then as you pass through that glide path, well, now you got to capture it, right? You saw those lights change really fast. You start pulling back to pull into the glide path. You go down right through there, and you forget that you're at idle. So now your airspeed's bleeding off, but you're on a glide path. Airspeed's still high, but bleeding off quickly. 200 feet. Well, you blew through the glide path. You're trying to get that in there. Your airspeed's depleting. And now you see four red on your pappies the, the, on the side. Your airspeed's low because you never caught that it was still depleting and you're still at idle. And you hear a stall horn. So now you're startled by what's going on. 200 feet AGO. So make a decision. Is anyone uncomfortable yet? Are you okay? I've only got one hand that's uncomfortable. Here. Everyone else is a lot more proficient than I am or, or cavalier. I don't know. The five nautical mile final, that's where you were at? Well, no, okay, so if you're on an instrument approach and the weather's bad, you think the guy behind you's gotta go around, <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. Right, but if it's EMC, you just say, break me off, I'll come back around, you know, right there, I'm full of point number two. Right, and that brings up two things, right? You're getting the pressure there, but also it changes based on visual versus instrument conditions and who's controlling the flight path here. Um, okay, so this is good. This is, I mean, this is getting sketchy to me, right? Um, get down here to the end, 100 feet, 172, late July, up at Bryce Canyon, a little high altitude, and finally 200 feet, I should probably go around. You start putting that power in. Do you think that thing's going to build up a lot of energy and a lot of power quickly? Yeah, you're going to be lucky to get it into ground effect and let it start building up, but if you do that too late, like not looking good for you. So does anyone know who I'm talking about here? All right, we've got at least one hand. Does anyone else know where this comes from? All right, so I do want you thinking about this through a general aviation mindset, uh, but this is exactly what happened with Asiana, San Francisco. So ultimately VMC conditions, how I, I've got six minutes. So VMC conditions, Visual, they used, used an instrument to back it up. They're coming in here to land two ways left, coming over the bay. And I won't bore those of you who don't have an instrument rating to walk through it. But ultimately, they're trying to come through the glide path. They were high above it. They got vectored on. And this is an incredibly complex graph. But the main thing I want to focus here, this red line is the descent path they should have been following with the tappy. This blue line is what they actually did. Dive, 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 dive. Oops, we went below it. 
You've forgotten to pull power back in, trying to build that up, air speed's going to crap, and that now you're short final. Oh, that's good to know. So uh, in the report, it talked about what they would have been seeing. So yeah, they were they were tuned localizer only uh, while they were doing this. And I went to the report where it talked about the lights they would have seen. So actually four. What's that? The check pilot and a new captain. Yeah. So this is a captain, so an experienced pilot, but changing seats from FO and a check pilot in the right seat. Um, which, again, we're going back to letting people make mistakes they could learn from, um, but I'm imagining this is career-ending. And the check pilot had, was new to the airframe as well. Oh, okay. The check pilot didn't have very many hours on the airframe. And he had like a thousand, so it wasn't like well, a brand the airframe new. Is it, it the airframe, is um, it Does anyone recall, is it triple seven? All right. So ultimately, they came in really low below glide path. The tail hits right on the bank here, and then it cartwheeled, ended up over there. Surprisingly, like for number of fatalities, uh, shocking uh, that so many people survived. Uh, I was in San, living in San Francisco at the time. I remember hearing on the news, and I couldn't believe something like this in this day and age could happen. Um, but ultimately, aircraft's lost there. This is a good visual of what it looks like uh, for where the glide path they should have been and where they actually were, and then they built in the approach lighting system there as well. Curtis? I have one morning, Antenna 214, final seven miles south to it. Antenna 214, average San Francisco, sorry, and we should be left there, Lynn. Antenna 214. Decision to go around, way too late. Pitch instead of energy. Normal glide path still just cruising above them. And for this for now, Skyhawk 737, go around. That's 1,500 feet, please, over 10 colors. Obviously, the Skyway 6389, maintain 3,000. All right, we can cue to the That's it. Oh, no, so, ultimately, through this, what I'd like you to think about is we treat go-arounds too casually, in my opinion. These should be a maneuver we are briefed, prepared for, and ready to do at any given moment, from a long final out all the way into you're down on the runway and rolling out and still deciding whether a go-around should apply. Um, these are things that you should have objective criteria, whether you're not using the plus 10 minus 5 on your airspeed, what you, where you're allowing, allowing yourself on that glide path, where you're touching down on that runway, we do it on the 70, now I forget now, 70, 30, 70, 50 year old, there we go. For our takeoffs, why aren't we doing this on our landings about how much runway and energy we can have before we're making that decision? Obviously, we're not trying to add extra workload to your mind, but you should have gates essentially that you're going through in my new vernacular is that each place that you're deciding, this is where I need to be at this point, and if you can correct quickly, correct. If you can't, just go around. Set it up for the next one, then pick up your next gate. This becomes more and more critical as you're getting down to that short final, crossing the threshold, and those wheels start touching down. Um, so setting that up and having that as a criteria that you're willing to follow and that you will teach other people in the airplane what you're doing and why you're doing it. So we can set an example as people are coming into CAP um, and also with the students that we're flying with as well as just fellow pilots that we're, we're flying with and help support each other in the pilot monitoring phase of uh, making that decision. I brief every passenger because most of the time when I fly with the cap, I'm flying with another pilot. Um, it's not just a, uh, sometimes it's just an observer, but they usually still know enough about the plane, but I brief them. I want them to be able to make that decision for me too. If they are uncomfortable or see something that I don't see and I hear them say go around, I don't particularly care why they said it. I'll figure that out when I'm back up to altitude. A lot of times I'll hear the go around. Well, no, it's fine. I'll work this out. Well, why are you saying that? It's like, don't waste the time doing it. Just go around, figure that out later. Um, I think that's it on time, or do I still have a few seconds? One minute. Any final questions or comments? Mr. Jerry. Realize that a go around can happen early, but it can also happen even after your wheels are on the ground. You, you can be rolling out and see a problem, and if you've got a reasonable chance of taking it back into the air, 
it's not too late to go around, even when you're down to 50 knots. Agreed. We. Uh, even at the airlines, I think there's this expectation bias in terms of I'm going to land the airplane. If anything, it's probably worse at the airline. And the only way to really get around that is to brief the, the, the go around as part of the approach. Um, because we do it so rarely, we have to have that in our mind as this is the way that it's going to conclude. Um, because otherwise, it, it comes up as a surprise, and that's where people get in a lot of trouble. Some of the worst uh, situations that I've heard of in the airlines are coming to go around. Not in any other case of flight. Not in the approach, not in the landing. They come to go around where people aren't expecting it, and they get uh, unusual flight attitudes because they have not prepared for the airplane. And final comment before Greg throttles me on the way out of here. Um, pay attention the next time you're landing or as you're pilot monitoring in the right seat, where those hands are of the person who is flying. It's all too common. You see that ready to pull the power back to idle and not to push it in. Um, and it's more prevalent on the where you have the throttle versus our little plunger. But pay attention to what you're set up for, whether you're just planning the landing or whether you're really set up for that go road. Thank you, sir. <laughs>